doing here with Handmade Puppet Dreams is we're making a movement and we're doing it with shorts. There are these people across the country that are building and making puppets and their sculptures and they're animating them with live movement and putting it onto film. You can just dive into each one for a, like a moment in time. So you can get a breath of what all these different styles of puppet films can be. I guess we want to inform people and inspire people to maybe make their own puppet films. It's an accessible art form that, that you can embrace and use it to tell your own stories. I hope you enjoy Him New Puppet Dreams. Hello, people of the internet. My name is Alex U. Griffin, and I am the current producer for Heather Henson's Handmade Puppet Dreams film series. First off, we are so honored to be a part of the 2022 London International Mime Festival, and excited to be presenting not only our special curation of five nonverbal real-time puppetry films, but this wonderful talk back with the filmmakers. First though, some of you may be asking, as I've been asked many times before, what is a handmade puppet dream? Well, a part of Heather Henson's Greater Ibex Puppetry, Handmade Puppet Dreams is a traveling film series that promotes independent artists exploring their handmade craft specifically for the screen. These films all focus on real-time puppetry and allow artists to build their vision and then breathe life into their dreams. Founded in 2004, Handmade Puppet Dreams now includes nine main volumes of films, three volumes for families, and many unique collections, including three collections that were made during the pandemic. Amazing, right? With this series, Heather Henson set out to showcase a new generation of puppeteers and puppet artists who embrace film as a medium for their artistic expression. I hope you all enjoyed the films and enjoy this look at the artists behind or, or, or under, or, or sometimes kind of running back and forth. Yeah, I hope you enjoy this look at the artists themselves. And with that, I'd love to have the filmmakers introduce themselves and going in alphabetical order, Let's start with Raymond Carr. Raymond, take it away. My film is called Hitori, um, and uh, I am a puppeteer and um, film director, as well as just a freelance artist. Um, and for me, uh, puppetry has been a part of my life for most of my life, honestly. Uh, I got started uh, working in um, the church with my parents, even though I'm not in the church anymore. Um, doing just shows for kids. Um, and from there, I wanted to do, just have my own creative outlet, you know, and I was always too shy for theater or uh, being in front of camera. So puppetry was a really great outlet for me um, to still express myself creatively, but not have to worry about, you know, my face and my hands and my body. Um, so, I, and I also really liked the, um, uh, the lack of limitations that puppetry gives you. You really can be just about anything and have it be believable because everybody believes that that puppet is what that puppet's built to be. Um, so that's always why I've been drawn to puppetry uh, is because of its um, how, how expressive and uh, diverse the characters that you can uh, portray either on stage or on film um, for me. I would love to have the fabulous Julie Elkins introduce herself. Hi, I'm Julie, I'm from Virginia. I'm an artist. Um, I got into puppetry when I was a little kid, when I, I saw the documentary, the behind the scenes documentary after Labyrinth. And I saw that and I was like, that's what I wanna do. But since then I've been doing all kinds of stuff, um, ceramics, teaching art, making music videos, and now puppet video movies. Great, and can you tell us uh, which film you made as well? I forgot to put that part on there. Playing a possum. Awesome, thank you. Um, and let's move on to uh, Jonathan. My name is Jonathan Loniger and I co-wrote and directed the short film Cosmic Fling. Um, I'm generally artistic and I got drawn toward um, filmmaking and I always wanted to make things that were a bit fantastical and that included characters that weren't necessarily live action humans. So I found the 
best way to do that was to use puppetry. Fantastic. And let's move on to Myra. Oh, uh, hi, Myra. I'm a puppet artist based in Chicago. Um, probably got into puppetry a little bit later. I got into it in college through um, manual cinema. So I think what drew to me drew me to it was it kind of combined my love for theater and love for animation in this like wonderful bundle. Um, so yeah, and I primarily work with paper and shadow, but I dabble in <laughs> all, all, all sorts of stuff. So, oh, I made um, a good night shadow. Great. Thank you, Myra and Vanessa. Hello, um, I'm Vanessa, this is John. I should say, I didn't put his name on the thing. We made gut feelings, gut feelings. And um, see, how did I get into puppetry? I was doing a lot of um, theater in general and uh, studied a little bit of clown and such. Um, and then at some point I was part of a festival that wanted me to make a solo show and I think on some level, I didn't want it to be a solo show and yet also didn't have anybody that I was working with. <laughs> and so I made myself a co-puppet. Uh, co um, I, I had this, I think actually, I, I had this dress that I wanted something, it was a really pretty dress. I want something kind of horrible to happen in. Um, and so I, I wanted it to have like a um, parasitic twin. And I think just wanting that was where a puppet, a puppet came from that desire. And Honestly, I just haven't stopped since that initial parasitic twin. <laughs> but John, did you want to say anything about? Oh, yeah, I'm John Gorian, and um, and we made we made the film together. And yes. I'm a stage actor, and um, so I haven't done much puppetry at all, uh, with the exception this is our first project together. Mm -hmm. And um, and you did some puppets. He also, if I may, he did some puppets on a Mary Zimmerman show here in Chicago at Looking Glass, where they actually had quite a few puppets in the show. But it was a very physical, and it was a nonverbal, very physical show called The Steadfast and Shoulder. And he did at least yeah two or three puppets. Yeah, and those those puppets were built by uh, Blair Thompson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys. Um, what prompted you to create a nonverbal puppetry short? It made the most sense for me. It would be, it would have been a completely different beast with dialogue. And my experience was with music videos, which didn't have di dialogue other than the lyrics maybe in the song. So I was used to storytelling with just um, movement. Um, yeah, and I guess production, like uh, rely, the team I had to rely on, like I don't, like it, it was just another beast, dialogue, voice actors, building puppets that had uh, moving parts that wouldn't look ridiculous when they talk. So, and I also wanted it to be universally ex accessible as far as like no language barriers. Great, thank you so much. Um, and uh, to Jonathan. The idea for Cosmic Fling had been around for maybe 10 years. Um, it was gonna be a CG short at one point and then um, live action with human beings. Um, and then my friend Taylor Bebot suggested we use puppets. Um, and the, you know, as soon as she said that it really clicked and using marionettes especially made a lot of sense um, because it really, it mimics this idea of weightlessness. Um, it also has kind of thematic meaning in terms of connection and you know being strung together um so it always just made a lot of sense and no dialogue was necessary or even kind of possible because because of the situation between these two characters and i've always been drawn to non-dialogue stuff um i was fascinated um early on with uh silent films and just how expressive they can be and there's something very kind of pure about using cinema to tell a story without relying on dialogue. I just really love that as a creative um, limitation. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, and Myra? I think my brain just works that way. I, I'm just drawn to doing not stuff non-verbally. I'm more of a visual um, kind of artist than a, than a text-based one. So maybe it largely comes from the fact like I wouldn't know, know how to even write a script for something like this. Um, yeah, I wish I could be better at dialogue, but 
I don't think I am very good at that, but yeah, it's just my natural inclination, I think. Thank you. And Vanessa and John. There's something about the universality of the, the lack of speech that I really, really like, that it can get to things that you can't put into words. Um, and so I really like that. I think that um, Jonathan was saying something sort of similar. Yeah. Oh, well, and I, um, I've always been a really a very physical actor with um, like a ton of improv training. And most of that is literally making something from you know, nothing. So I come from a long tradition of building environments and, and physicalizing things that aren't there. And, and that goes into everything that I do, like mm. any even scripted shows that I do. Mm. So that's that. Great, thank you so much. Raymond? Um, so Hitori was originally developed with um, my creative partner, Wade, Raymond w Wade Tilton. His first name is also Raymond. Um, and uh, it was originally referred to as the dark piece um, because we had done um, another piece called the light piece, or the white piece rather. And the white piece was nonverbal and it was uh, mostly set to music and it was all done um, with flashlights against the white sheet. Um, and so we wanted to just show an, 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 a different uh, version, tell a different story, but just make it more darker. Um, and for me, knowing that Hitori was going to be a very simple hero's journey um, that was going to just articulate very simple concepts, um, it never made sense to have any dialogue. None of the characters have mouths in, in the show, uh, in, in the piece. So the idea of dialogue always seemed, I don't even think it entered into our minds. We knew we wanted it to be movement based. And the idea behind the piece was always uh, to have it be abstract. And we were very influenced by um, the uh, mime troupe Mamanshams, um, legendary uh, troupe Mamanshams. Um, and we always were just in love with how much they could convey just with their bodies and their props and what they were trying to do. Um, and there was a story, but you really weren't totally sure what it was saying. It was open for interpretation. And I, and I just love that so much. So uh, yeah, Hitori never really had, um, I don't think there was even a question that it wouldn't be anything other than nonverbal. What do you feel is the power within puppetry, especially when viewed alongside uh, many other wonderful artistic art forms of storytelling? I think it has a great immediacy to it. You know, there's, there aren't as many kind of layers of, you know, layers between you and the actual performance of the creature or, you know, person. You know, if you're doing it with CG, there's a lot of, that has its advantages because you can do a lot of revision and stuff like that. And you can plan ahead a little bit more exactly, precisely. Um, but with puppetry, all that is kind of stripped away and you're left with this sort of immediate instinctual reaction. I mean, you can be you can be precise, but there's more of an organic sort of imperfect immediacy to it that's really gratifying, um, and it kind of takes away the net, so to speak. So you're taking more risks um, because there isn't as much of a revision process that you might have with um, computer generated characters. I think what's interesting with puppetry is that you have that direct access to this character and object because you're literally touching it and manipulating it, right? Um, but there's an interesting overlap, I think, with animation and just like fine art in general. And I think what's interesting with puppets is your characters, your, your puppets can literally, very literally kind of manifest um, like themes you're exploring. So for instance, like if you're, if you're exploring themes of like, I don't know, human fragility or something, you can literally make your puppets out of fragile materials and they literally embody like the, the overarching concept of your show. So um, that's, I, that's, I think, particularly interesting to me with puppets when the medium, the choice of medium speaks to like, um, yeah, larger narrative themes in your work. And puppetry, I think, is a really good tool to do something like that. Uh, I was just thinking about it in, as it pertains to our particular film. Like, I think there's something about the fact that we are um, humanettes that sets a certain tone right out of the gate 
that I thought was really like, it's don't take it too seriously, but <laughs> like, don't take it too seriously right away. But then I like that you eventually hopefully start to get invested and take it seriously. So it sneaks up on you that way. And I think that that's because we are, we have doll bodies. You know, I think so. And I think that, I think that there are other ways to accomplish that tone, but there is something about it, the way it's done with humanettes that I really found fun. The worlds that you can create with, with puppetry and animation can go far beyond like just the regular physical mundane human level. Right. And I mean, that can be anything. It could be like mask work, you know, you put on right. a mask, suddenly it gives you so much more freedom to uh, to embody other physical concepts, or and to go beyond uh, just human action, you know. We're so limited by what we are, and prejudged based on how we look physically. So there's a very uh, limited scope of characters that I can play, the way I look, how tall I am, the size I am, and all the and the way I talk. Whereas a puppet can uh, really broadens my um, horizon as to the types of characters and stories I can tell when I'm just by myself or when I'm performing by myself for an audience. So that's always been exciting to me is just how uh, versatile um, a of a story that one can tell with puppetry. To that, I wanted to just ask about uh, thoughts on accessibility. Like, does puppetry allow, do you feel that puppetry allows a greater sense of accessibility and why? You can be an incredibly shy person and I think puppetry gives you confidence to be able to per perform in general in front of people. Um, Cause it gives you like a character to hide behind that doesn't have anything to do with your physical appearance. I mean, it might be a different kind of accessibility but there's certainly like, it brings, a lot of fantasy and sort of ridiculous storytelling within reach for you know filmmakers who don't have access to millions of dollars for a budget you know my thesis film at usc was about a cockroach um and so it's like obviously we, we didn't really have the budget to do it well with cg so just having an actual physical cockroach puppet that we could use um suddenly made that possible the whole point is not to be realistic necessarily um, and there's a lot of kind of liberation to that you wanted to have that tactile feeling and maybe lean into the style that isn't 100 percent realistic but you also want sophistication out of the puppets so that you can get the sort of expressiveness that you need out of them so it's always kind of a give give and take um, and you want to make the most out of the craft of puppetry um, but you're also not in it to necessarily to achieve realism. I think it's just because we honestly, humans have been doing puppets forever. So <laughs> I, I feel like that's what plays into the longevity of it, just because humankind's been doing this since, I don't know, even caveman times. And I think that's what's interesting to me about the question of accessibility and a supposed universality. I feel like puppetry as a medium is pretty damn close to a universal um, medium across uh, many different cultures, um, just because especially coming from a more theater-based background. I mean, modern theater as we know it today is very you know, Eurocentric, right? It's very much informed by traditions in the West. Um, but yeah, if you look through puppet history, pretty much every culture on earth has um, been big in puppetry in some shape or form. Um, I think it's also a great transition Honestly, Myra, uh, into just asking about your thoughts on your film or puppetry performances in general, nonverbal puppetry performances in general, and viewing so in the context of a mime performance or their connection to just nonverbal storytelling. The idea of being able to perform in a nonverbal mime style um, was very attractive to us. Uh, just because we were interested in telling the story that was asking these really abstract, the big questions of like control and destiny and purpose and all these sorts of things. And you can get a sense of that by watching this nonverbal piece. And maybe you can have a sense of my opinion about 
those things, uh, which is different from my creative partner's opinion, uh, oddly enough. Uh, so, you, and, and then you, as an audience member, you can create your own. Um, and though, then by uh, the nature of mime and nonverbal performances in general, it, is that it is very open to interpretation. I I think I think there's def I'm not an I'm not an a physic I'm not an actor by any means but I um I do reference like um mime and pantomime esque approach <laughs> um when designing puppets and approaching puppets I think it's a similar process of um you have to distill down the and emotions and story into specific gestures and like everything is rooted in action right. Um, so in a similar way, when you're approaching designing a puppet, you have to, and especially in this particular context, when a lot of us were making films in quarantine conditions, so we had limited hands often. So um, in my case, I had to simplify a lot of the puppets just because I, I pretty, pretty much just had my roommate to help me um, manipulate these. So it really pushes you to... Um, uh, to distill down the action to a, an essential gesture that you can then translate in your process of making a puppet. Um, so I think there's a lot of overlap with a live action mime performance and that being really specific with these physical actions that are going on your face or in your body. Um, and puppets are very much um, operate in that same kind of logic as well. I think there's a special kind of magic in communicating a feeling to an audience member without telling them what that feeling is. Um, and that's something, you know, filmmaking and puppetry and mime, mime, mime craft, is that a word? Um, all have in common, you know, it's, it's, if you're not kind of force fed the feeling that the artist wants you to feel, it, it lands a lot better. Um, where you're just looking at a thing and having this realization, that's just a very beautiful thing that all these art forms can accomplish. Do you, any of you have feelings on how mime performance and puppetry performance are connected within the spectrum of the physical performance world, uh, both on stage and or screen? We take for granted as this conversation, as we have conversations every day where I'm gesturing and moving my hands and pointing and things and everybody knows what those things mean and it's to accentuate the verbal when I'm not talking, it requires a little more intent. Um, so as a performer with puppetry, you do have to be intentional and think about your movements and your body and what the puppet's doing in a way that a mime thinks about the intent of their movement with their hands and legs and limbs and what have you. Uh, so just being aware of uh, your own performance physically and what that is communicating is a way that puppetry and miming does um, uh, sync up, I think. I've only taken a, a few mime classes, you know, I'm not like, but I feel like the understanding of the human body and how, like, there's a, especially in, from what I, what little I know of Decru, like, there's a real, like, I have to, a real approach to how the human body moves and an understanding of how, how the human body moves. And I feel like people who are moving, puppets also are like trying to make the connection between how the human body moves and how this thing will move, whether it's a, a human puppet or it's a puppet that, you know, is like, how will this thing move considering it's, um, so it's like a study of the, it's a study of how the thing will move based on what it, ha what it has, <laughs> you know, like how it's put together. Um, well, think about how many points of articulation there are in the human body. Right? right. So when you study mime, you figure out absolutely every way that you possibly move in order to uh, portray what you intend. Right. And then, but I've seen uh, I've seen puppetry where the puppet is just uh, just like a little block of wood. Right. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in a lot of ways, um, intention is what 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 gives the information, right? mm -hmm. Intention is what uh, relays uh, the information to the audience. If you have uh, a, a good idea of what the mm -hmm. human body can do, you can give that movement, movement's intention to a very less articulated object. Yes. 
and give it life. Am I? Yes. I personally really like the idea that puppetry and mime both uh, look at kind of the broader strokes of how we communicate with our physicality. I feel like mime is playing off of something and the audience's imagination of either caring or not caring within a performance because so much can often be a person on even an empty stage and we are filling in the blanks of what we care or do not care about within that performance and I feel like essentially you're kind of doing the same thing but in a medium where filling out the world is often considered to be like of the utmost importance. There was actually like with Cosmic Fling there's more stuff involved like he was going to re recalibrate this satellite dish and there was this cruise line that passes and sometimes with that stuff I'm like um just kind of feeling the sense of like dread and also like like is this necessary and an event like also production issues it's like we have to build this other set and stuff like that and and it always just gets stripped down to its bare essentials so maybe with if someone had handed me a million dollars to make this thing, maybe it would have been more of a fleshed out world. Um, but in the end, it's always kind of a gut call where it's like it feels clunky or it feels like too much or I don't care. It's just too much business going on on screen. Like you just kind of want the emotion. Like initially, um, we're going to see this cruise liner go past his asteroid at the very beginning. And he looks through a telescope to see this cruise liner. People are dancing on it. And he's thinking like, oh, I wish I was dancing with someone. And it's like, and we also heard this transmission from the, the cruise liner, like, you know, Saturn cruise liner, like, you know, and it, it plays music and stuff like that. And in the end, it's like, well, how good is that going to look? Number one, like number two, does it get across the feeling and eventually we kind of, I just kind of realized like, it'd be better just to have this kind of heart box flying through space. And then he, he harpoons it and it's like, you get it. Like he wants love. You don't have to go through all the kind of hullabaloo of establishing that there are space cruise lines that there's an announcer and the people are dancing on board, yada, yada, yada. It just seems like too much stuff to say something that's very, very simple is he wants love. He's stuck on an asteroid. It's all you need to say. So I always kind of gravitate towards simplicity. I unintentionally left the relationship between the, the main character possum and the dying possum kind of ambiguous. Like I didn't, like I could have shown what that relationship was. And to me, it was based on my mom. So that was a daughter possum and their dying mother, but it was kind of left open for interpretation and I'm glad I left it open because um, after showing people, like I showed my grandparents when they watched it, they said, oh, she lost her baby. And then another friend watched it and they said, oh, she lost her little sister. So they put, you know, their life experience, they could relate to it because it was left open. And I just, I really like, I really like that. That made me happy. Inevitably, when we're making something, it's always going to be coming from a personal place. Um, but at least for me, I think um, I'm most satisfied with my work when it goes through a kind of a rigorous um, translation process to, I hate to say remove the personal part, but like to kind of dig at it to get at some root of it and, and, and displaying the final product in this more kind of generalized but very kind of uh, distilled form. Um, so I think it's a really good editing practice. In our film, uh, none of our characters have a backstory. Yeah, that's true. You know? Yeah. <laughs> of, we don't know what happened to any of these characters 10 minutes before the that's actual true. film. We have no idea. And I think that's perfectly fine. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of like, well, this, Maybe she's maybe she wakes up in these dolls. Oh yeah, and there's a guy and he's feeding her. Yeah, and then what happens? Well, I don't know. She, I just have an image of she wakes up and somebody puts a light on and she's inside of them. Or no, that you were the one who was like, maybe he eats her. That's what it was. It, it was just like 
just a funny, you know, it was like, like kids playing, you know what I mean? Sure. Where it's just like, oh, let's do this. And then you go and then he eats her. Okay. All right. He ate her. And now they're in there. And then, you know, and it's very, which I think is really hard for adults to get back to that place, which is why we want to fill in the blanks so that we know the whole story so then we can tell it because we're not, we forgot what it's like to just be like playing with each other and figuring things out. What is the general inspiration and story behind your films? And what was the uh, production process like? So the inspiration of the film was actually inspired by Boon Raku puppetry um, and um, a Czech black or black theater puppetry where you perform in front of a, a dark stage and you have a puppet that you bring into the light and all the puppeteers seem like they've disappeared in the back. And I've seen that style of puppetry in the past and I always loved it. And I always was fascinated by what the puppeteers were doing in the back, like whose hand was operating the limbs or the head or what have you. And what were they doing to make the puppet move even though I couldn't really make out what the puppeteers were doing uh, in the background. And so I started creating these stories in, in my mind uh, about like what it required the puppeteers to do moving the puppet and the props and getting ready for the next puppet to come in and all that kind of stuff. So there was always this dance going on behind the scenes and you could kind of catch it, but you really were, uh, it wasn't intended to be seen. So I, I created these stories in my head about like what actually was happening or trying to solve the riddle of what was actually happening. Um, and then that kind of blew out to be like, okay, well, what if the entire world is made of these puppeteers um, and that's all there truly is? And if that is the case, then is this puppet really alive? And so I started to ask this question is like, can I make a puppet that goes through this journey that has ups and downs, wants and needs, but at no point are you ever denied the fact that this puppet is being operated by a puppeteer? Like I never try and make it feel like uh, the suspension of disbelief that we breathe magical life into the puppet that it's operating on its own. Some of the other things that you might find in a puppet film or a puppet theater piece where you're asking the audience to suspend your disbelief and believe that this puppet is really alive. And I was like, no, I want everyone to know at all times that this puppet is being manhandled by people. And can you still evoke an emotion from your audience if you know that when I slap this puppet and throw it up against the wall and it hits and comes plopping down, you still have an emotional connection or reaction to this puppet, even though you know I just picked it up with one hand and threw it. So uh, and that's always been fascinating. So, so whenever I, there is an audience uh, that does have a reaction to some of the more violent scenes in this um, or some of the more dramatic scenes in this film it always makes me laugh because i'm like can't you tell it's just a puppet <laughs> it's always kind of a my own practical joke on the audience um but at the same time it was an experiment to showcase that puppetry does have this ability to um you're not even suspending your disbelief because i'm not asking you to but you still have an emotional connection to connection to this inanimate object. So it was really about telling the most like basic story of a character trying to do a thing, coming up with obstacles and then achieving their goal and asking the audience to go along with this character on this journey, knowing full well that this character has no um, uh, agency of their own. Um, and yet some people would say that maybe the character does have agency of its own. So I knew I wanted to do live action as in out in the world, big puppets out in the world um, to capture the be natural beauty of where I lived. It's just really cinematic here. So I know that would help me <laughs> where I lacked in other areas. Um, I knew I wanted it to be a buddy film. There's like certain elements that I borrowed from my favorite movies, like a buddy film, um, a buddy that you're not sure if it's a pet or a companion, or maybe it's both. Um, and then I wasn't sure about the story. Um, it kind of unfolded as I was make, working on the characters. And I, I started with the characters um, and then the story came to me and it was an event that had happened to me and was kind of consuming my life, which was losing my mom. Um, and so I, I made the made the puppets first, storyboard it, um, 
And then I just waited on the availability of my friends who were the wolf um, and possum, and they're both single moms. So I was grateful to get them when I could. And we would just try to knock out as much as possible when they showed up. Um, then my, my husband, uh, Brad Moss did the soundtrack. We, he would work, he, he worked on that as I was shooting. Um, and so I think we shot everything in about three weeks. The puppets took about a month. We shot everything in about three weeks and then I edited it for a solid month. The inspiration behind it was, uh, my friend was doing this kind of motion capture thing and he needed like a test um, short film um, that fell through. We're gonna do a CG, that never happens. Years and years and years pass. We decided to do it with puppets, um, but the whole story is designed to be very simple. Um, you know, just like very simple environments, limited number of characters, kind of um, just simple all around storytelling. Um, and as far as the production goes, it was very complicated. Um, but fortunately, we had some of the best marionette puppeteers around, Philip Huber and uh, Chris, Christine Papalexis. Um, but we had just a couple days and we had like 40 shots scheduled per day or something like that. It was just never going to happen. <laughs> so we're constantly like paring back, you know, the more complicated shots. We're getting rid of shots entirely. Um, but in the end, I think that helped a lot. Um, you know, the ending was going to be very different in which these characters were going to reveal their faces. Um, um, and we rethought that not just because it was going to be hard to um, achieve effects wise, but it just didn't have the right feeling to it. Um, so we ended up like changing that up. Um, but the, the weirdest kind of moment on in production was you know, we, we shot the puppets first. Um, we had maybe two or three days of, I think two full days of puppet shoot and then maybe like a pickup day. And then we had the actors come in and they had to act um, as the, you know, the characters, but match their movements to the head movements of the puppets um, while kind of reacting in various ways. Um, so they had these green screen suits on and we had to very meticulously try to match their head movements and it was very 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 difficult um and weird because you know i'd be saying things like okay now you see a comet and there's an astronaut on the comet and she's so beautiful and blah 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 and um our actor was just very josh Fadon was just incredibly funny like the way he would kind of narrate all of his actions in this kind of like you know this He's just a very funny guy. So it's, it's, we had a lot of fun on set, but it was the most stressful production I've been a part of because of the lack of time and money and just the sheer complexity of what we're trying to pull off. So, um, but we worked with some really incredible people, um, incredibly talented designers and puppeteers. So I think we pulled off something magical, especially given the limitations we were dealing with. Okay, I'll try to make this short, but this woman, this woman who I do not know passed away and somebody called me and was like, I have like a box filled with these tiny dolls. And I know that you like to, cause a lot of my stuff has dolls in it. I know you like to work with dolls. Do you want them? And I, I wanted to say no, because I have so many, but she, I went over there and they're ceramic and they're he heavy. And she gave me this giant box of these little porcelain or ceramic dolls. And I said to John, wouldn't it be funny to just see a full frame of me, just my face buried in these? And he was like, that would be funny. I was like, can we just do it? Can we just take some photos? And then we started filming it a little bit. And I was like, I have this idea for this short piece. And so, and then I think from there, it was like, what if you start feeding me? And then, you know, what if a hand comes in and starts feeding me? And that's honestly the inspiration was just the image because the image of those dolls and me coming out of them was really, really fun for me to watch. And so everything that came after that was a result of that image, I think. Yes, for Goodnight Shadow, um, I started off in puppetry doing shadow puppets with manual cinema. So I was inclined to do something using shadow puppets with 
uh, at, about shadows. I didn't quite know what the story was yet. Um, and then at the time I was having feelings about growing up, I guess. And I don't know, seeing a shift of a changing relationship with um, <laughs> me and my parents, I guess. I don't know. I just, I, 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 yeah, not for the negative. It's just like things change, right? So um, I was in that kind of mindset. And my mom sent me this wonderful short story um, by Eduardo Galeano, very short story called um, Story of the Shadow. Um, and it was great. And that was um, the basically the structure um, I used to, um, make this piece so it's very loosely inspired by the by the story but it follows the narrative of like basically a a day a day to night kind of situation and how a shadow changes shape depending on where the sun is in the sky so that i use as like the grounding premise i started off storyboarding the piece and then i spent most of my time simultaneously building and filming um just because I don't know, like I, I I have to go in and film the puppet to figure out if it works and then go back to the drawing board and make more puppets. So, and it was also a lot of puppets to film, uh, to make like hundreds of these paper puppets. So I wasn't, I would feel, I would psychologically feel better if I was filming as I was going. I, uh, yeah, I tried green screening for the first time. Um, I came up with this method where I could try to basically essentially puppet by myself or with another person, layers of a scene, and then I can composite it later in post. Um, so yeah, in retrospect, looking back, I think there were some moments in my film that the green screening was more successful than others. I was, I didn't really know what I was doing, um, but that was my kind of big experiment to layer different puppet performances on top of each other. Um, and then that eventually became a very key technique for this film where there's um, basically it's like this this uh, this woman and her shadow, right? And I wanted the shadow to move and behave autonomously from from the actual person the cast was, shadows being cast from. So that green screening technique was something that was kind of crucial to create that effect. Um, yeah, because dabbling with film, I wanted to make something that wouldn't be possible alive. I wanted to take advantage of the form in some way, um, possibly messing myself up with some parts that weren't green screen that well, but that was my experiment. I think that's great. Yeah. Uh, well then I guess in general, and we'll start with John on this one, um, what are you currently working on or what are you looking forward to working on in the near future? Essentially what's up with you now? <laughs> Basically, me and my writing partner slash girlfriend are trying to crank out scripts for us to either get, you know, send out as a spec script to be bought or to direct ourselves. Um, so one of those is going to be sent out. It's called Ovum. It's like a sci-fi script. It's going to be sent out soon uh, this month. And we're working on another kind of family film um, that we're really excited about. Um, today, well, this past week, I had my first <laughs> this my first viral video on TikTok about ceramics, and there's this like a goofy dandelion mug, and it blew up, and everybody wants a dandelion mug, but I only had one, and it was already sold, so I decided to go ahead and take pre-orders. So I've been making a million dandelions that look like this, painting them on mugs. Um, but as far as film and puppetry, um, I have this character, puppet character Merv, who's got his own YouTube channel and he's a journalist. And I've been wanting to expand his world a little bit and like up the production value of that show, give him like a home base, um, maybe incorporate, I've talked to Vanessa about this, incorporate some of my friends who perform into the show. So like say, Merv's at home, he's doing goofy stuff. He checks his phone to watch some videos and then I can include my friend's work in the show. And then he goes out in the world, interviews people. I would like to, so I'd like to do that this year. I've got a short film idea that I got a green light with, with a studio, but it's kind of on hold a little bit. Um, I've got a million music videos I wanna make and I gotta do some sort of ceramic show. So I just got to figure out the order of all of that. 
and set goals. Next week is the Chicago Puppet Theater Festival, which Vanessa is also a part of. So I've been very busy with that. Um, Co-curating four puppet slams happening in two weeks. I'll also be performing some short puppet work with the new futurists then. So I'm getting ready to do live performance again. <laughs> um, and and uh, in the meantime, I'm also working on some commission work. I got a music video thing, more video stuff. So I'm learning a lot more now. We live in such a you know, screen-based world. Um, our the demand for attention is so different. So like things that can maybe run a little bit slower in person in a live show because everyone's in the same space, feeling this like, you know, energy that's in the room that you can't really put your finger on is a lot different than when it's just a screen. I think things tend to want to go a lot faster uh, and be a lot, I don't know, sharper and cleaner. Um, and so that's something I've had to learn tonally pacing wise. Um, yeah, but I'm a big fan fan of like mixing live and um, video. And I'm definitely taking things I'm learning from this more video centric process to also then reapply it back into the live space. So it's kind of a flip flopping thing. I have a short, it's like a seven minute piece that will eventually be a longer piece. Um, but for now, uh, there's gonna be an excerpt at the SLAM at the International Puppet Theater Festival. And then probably another, the longer version will be done at something called Scratch Night here in Chicago. And then it'll be like maybe a 15 minute piece. Um, and what, what was the other thing? Oh, and we we worked on a show during um, the pandemic oh, yeah. called Pool Party. And it so much the, the show is that I'm doing for um, Nasty British is nonverbal and Pool Party is also nonverbal. Right now we have about 30 minutes of show and we're working on making another it's a live, nonverbal, all physical theater stage play, I guess. With puppetry. With puppetry. And some elements of clown. But uh, yeah, definitely. But uh, I think we want it to be about an hour. Right now it's about a half an hour. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we're getting there. For me, my next steps and what I'm trying really interested in is um, telling stories that uh, speak to people who are not necessarily uh, always spoken to. Um, in addition to that, like getting my uh, my friends and, and so many talented artists that I know, getting them involved in projects and uh, helping them develop stories um, that they don't necessarily have the means or resources or even the, the, the creative knowledge to, uh, to do, um, even though I know that they are uh, incredibly talented artists. So uh, I, I'm very interested in partnering with um, uh, collaborators uh, that I know and some that I meet um, in the hopes that we can create content and, and shows and stories that uh, will ultimately uplift ourselves um, as storytellers, but also the um, issues and projects and people that we are uh, passionate about in the world. So um, that's just to say that I'm in development mode with uh, a couple of different people that we're, we're all just trying to push ahead on our next projects. Thank you all so much for participating. Thank you all. Well, first off, thank you all so much for making fantastic films um, and fantastic nonverbal films. And that brings us to the end of this fantastic talk back to the wonderful people of the internet turning in. Thank you for having interest and showing support in these independent artists exploring their handmade craft on screen. We are so honored to be a part of the prestige and legacy of the London International Mime Festival. And for folks interested in finding out more about us, Handmade Puppet Dreams and our parent company, Ibex Puppetry, please visit our websites at handmadepuppetdreams.com, ibexpuppetry.com, and follow our social media on Instagram and Facebook for upcoming screenings, streamings, and events. Finally, on behalf of the Handmade Puppet Dreams and Ibex Puppetry teams, thank you all so much for tuning in, and I genuinely hope that you are doing the very best possible during this time. Thank you. Thank you.